I was waiting for you to start, and I was going to interrupt you and turn the tables for once. I, I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was waiting for uh, the Zen man to say action, and he did it. He said action. It was back to us, but somehow we managed to hear it, and I think that's wonderful. Action. Now, so you, go right ahead. You have a great story to tell, and you're going to top this story, but I, again, a little therapy session here, one of my biggest disappointments in life with a celebrity in the audience was when I was booked on maybe the highest end gig I've ever had to perform for some advertising executives at uh, a high-end hotel right across from a, a tennis event where they had the famous, te well, all the tennis players. And I went up and I was having such a great time on that weekend, I wasn't mentally focused for the show. I, I, it was tough, but I should have gotten them. I, it, my fault, I didn't get them, I bombed. And sitting at the bar watching me bomb, Alan King. And when I walked, uh, I'll ne Jackie, I'll never forget this, when I walked to the back of the room and brought up the next guy, who to make it worse, got him eventually. Uh, I walked past Not D.F. Sweetler. No, not. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I walked past Alan King, not that close, I wasn't, but I, I did glance over at him, and he, he looks like this and goes. <laughs> that will stick with me. And it was my fault. The good but, news no, is by every my... report I've ever heard, he's such a dick. Really? Was always such a dick. Well, now I'm cheered up. Good. Good. He, he, uh, <laughs> he was, you know, uh, the guy who's producer of our Channel 9 show actually wrote a show that, uh, that Alan, who, was it George Burns? Some one-man show that this guy, John, that me and Fred made fun of for two years. And he turns out the guy's multi-talented producer, writer, and everything. But he, he worked with Alan King. I guess they were really good friends, and he wouldn't say a word. You know, oh, like, wow. out of school, you know. And I think Alan King had a hand in Martin and Lewis. I think, I think Alan King was on the bill oh, wow, really? with a singer at the Iridium in Manhattan. And Dean Martin was his roommate. Oh. And I think the singer got sick. And he said, my roommate could fill in. And Dean Martin worked at the Iridium. And then Jerry, that's the first place where Jerry Lewis jumps on stage and harasses him. And like, you know, everything in New York is like George Washington has slept here or Harry yes. Smith did this. And I said, the guys that own the Iridium, I said, what are you doing? That's, your, you know, the first place that Dean Martin and Lewis and Jerry Lewis were on stage together. To me, even if it was a lie, but it's true. You know where the Iridium oh, is, right? Yes, right below yes. Ellen Stardust. Right, I, I mean, know. that whole place is all about uh, Ellen was Miss Subway in 1979, I mean, 1959. If you're making that into a story, for Christ's sakes. Wow. But uh, I love it. But that's fun. You know? Oh, now, in our you know, I, I used to work in Connecticut, and I was always on I-95 with the Breakfast Flakes, and uh, there was a classic. I was on the air with them one time, way early, like 1979 or 1980. And while they were talking to me, I farted. And I mean really loud. And they were like, they couldn't believe it. <laughs> and we laughed and laughed. And that night I was at Brad's place. Uh, the tree house. Tree house, yeah. And some guy in the back of the room said, who farted on the radio? <laughs> and then years later, I'm on with this guy, Howard Stern. I, I, there's no way I could tell him I farted on the radio four years ago. You know, he would have never believed it. How loud? It must have been. I it, can't believe it. And that's how loud it had to be for the other guys to hear it. And here I am. I'm asking Jackie to elaborate on this. <laughs> that's what a professional I am. So, uh, wow. Classic, classic stuff. Now, I got to tell you. That was a bad story that I... Oh, I, the, but what I was going to say, though, Alan I used, they used to promote me, and I would work these shows, not, not the Treehouse, but there was a couple of shows I worked in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, for whatever the promoter was, and all of Guthrie came and stood in the back and listened to my Arlo jokes Guthrie. for half an hour and then kept going, and, and they said, well, Arlo Guthrie was here, because he lived right there. And then on like, the way... why didn't you tell him the way... And then he, another time I was there, they said, Arlo was here again. I'm like, Jesus Christ, you know, tell him the... I want to say hello. I still never met him. And on his way home, ironically, he dumped some garbage, <laughs> and the police found it. The two of you that have any idea what that <laughs> reference is... Alice's Restaurant. 
That's a famous, famous classic. Uh, classic. Uh, His uh, daughter, Kathy, Kathy Guthrie, is in a two-man group with Willie Nelson's daughter Amy, and the name of their band is Folk Uke. <laughs> <laughs> and Kathy plays the guitar, and Amy plays the ukulele, or vice versa. I love it. And they're so fun. I I did a show with them, and uh, it was so funny because I knew I was going to do there was a it was a, a pot show in Austin. And the only way that Willie Nelson will do something, at the time, would do something like that is if it benefited the Marijuana Policy Project and Normal National Organization, because they didn't want to show favorites. So they co-produced this big show, and I was on the show, and uh, asleep at the wheel, and I'm worried how they're going to take to my dirty jokes because it's, you know, a gentle place. I mean, yeah. it was, this was 20 years ago, so it's a little, you know, who knows how they're going to react to me in Austin. But the opening act was Kathy and Amy, and Willie sang along with them. And their first song was Mother Effer Got Effed Up and Effed Up My Life. <laughs> and that's the chorus. And the three of them are singing. I'm thinking, you know, maybe they can. Maybe they can it's okay to me. do dirty. <laughs> Did you get through that show without uh, farting? And, and, and my friends came from Florida and from Denver, and it was one of the classic. Oh, without farting. Without farting. No, no, no. I always fart during my show. <laughs> In fact, people that know me, I pull on my ear when I do it. Oh, that's hysterical. Yeah. And All people right. think I'm saying hello to Carol Burnett. Do you remember John Viner? Of course, of course you do. So he was 10 years before us, right? Five years before us? Maybe a little more. Cause I think, yeah, because yeah. he was a, he was, a stand-up originally. He was on the Ed Sullivan show. He was one of the guys who did Ed Sullivan. Not the only one, but he did Ed Sullivan and exaggerated Ed Sullivan. So most people thought that that was what Ed Sullivan totally sounded like. John Biner is one of the guys who was doing an impression of Will Jordan. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. And that is great. That is in Ed Sullivan's book. That is great. I love it. I love it. That's a little uh, comedy history right there. Will Jordan was the original to do Ed Sullivan. John, and they're exaggerating Ed Sullivan, which is what a comedian's supposed to do. Ed Sullivan did virtually none of the stuff that Will Jordan did. You know, that, that whole thing turning around and spinning around and... He, he never said really big stage in his <laughs> really, life. Big really big shoe. Really big shoe. So I was on uh, the A&E show, Comedy on the Road, and John Viner was the host. And he was so nice backstage, and he's hanging out with us. And he told a story about how he was on Ed Sullivan, and he was supposed to, at the end of his set, walk over and shake hands with Ed Sullivan. And they had like a two-line joke set up. And... <laughs> The punchline was for Ed, and John Biner had the setup, and he goes over, and he does the setup for the joke, and Ed Sullivan looks at him and he goes, uh, uh, so how's your family? <laughs> he, he, did, he forgot the punchline. No, no idea what no. was going on. That, you gotta love that. <laughs> Even Mike Douglas went, wow, that was awkward. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, you could, you, I just imagine him standing there going to himself, this is so uncomfortable, but my God, this is going to be a great story. For the rest <laughs> of the, you know. So anyway, I go up uh, during, um, the com- when the comedians were on, uh, it was in Chicago, uh, John Biner used to introduce us from the audience and sit ringside when you were performing. Was this Showtime on the Road? Or it, one was of those? A- it was A&E's Comedy on the Road. And um, so I, I go up there and for whatever reason, uh, having the set of my life. And it's just going really well. Obviously, there's no tape of it. <laughs> and they forgot to turn on the tape. <laughs> um, so uh, it's just going perfectly. And I catch his eye like three quarters of the way through. And I'll never forget this. He was so cool. He just looks, he just looks at me, winks, and goes like that. It's just one of the thrills I'll never, it gives me the little, oh, oh, oh I mean, it was just such a I was, so, cool, I was scared you were going to say he was asleep. It no, been, no, 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 no. He did something so classy that I'll just never, I'll never forget. But you teased in our previous episode, 
All he had to say was, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that and became one of Rodney's things that he's worked into his act. He tried you know, to. All I, all I care is, like, just give me one of these. I know. And you know what give I think? Give me one of these. Uh, Rodney got something that a lot of comedians never get in their life, and that's a hook. I don't get no respect. He didn't need he was, another hook. He was trying for another one, but that one never really worked. Uh, just give opinion. me one of these. Yeah, I know. He tried to make that. But that really is a nice thing. It's a nice you know. thing, but it, it, he wanted it to be it another. Comes in handy I don't, I don't get night, no. Too. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. You know, um, but I'm I'm a Beatles fanatic, and I'm not going to let you get away without. Oh, oh, oh for sure. Um, and it's not even a Beatles song. The what I was going to say, because you said, oh, they didn't turn on the, the microphone. Right. I don't know if it stop me if we talk about this, because obviously you have no qualms about repeating stuff. <laughs> um, I know a guy who was an intern. He wor he was either one of our producers. He was very high up. But he had been an intern, I think, Channel 7. I'm not 100% sure. Jack Parr got knocked off the air for what they called cursing, which wasn't cursing. And he'd been out, blah, blah, blah. And things finally got settled down. And like a couple of years later, they're going to give him a show and give him another shot. And he goes out, and the place is packed, and it's unbelievable. And he went out, and this guy said he delivered the monologue of a lifetime, and the people were so hungry and just so anxious to see him, and they went wild, and they loved him. And it, you know, and we'll be right back, folks. Talk back. Um, sorry, Jack. We had some problem here in the control room. You're gonna have to do the monologue again. And he said he just spent the next ten minutes berating ABC, yelling, complaining about show business, how unfair it was. I think his show lasted two days. You can check that on the Google. I never really went through. He said, imagine that situation. I mean, I mean, any situation where somebody has a... Jackie, know. I swear, I'm 90 plus percent sure I watched his redo of that monologue. And I remember, I read about it later in the paper. How they uncomfortable? How it was, he had to do the same monologue again. To the same? <clears throat> and he made some sort of a comment. I don't have it exactly right, but he was mad. And it never didn't make sense at first, but then when I read the article in the newspaper that it, it was the second taping, it makes sense. He, he, he's doing well. He's doing his monologue. And then he stopped and he said, did you get that? <laughs> and then he said something because we did you get that because we hire the handicapped which is did you get that is even funny even back then but back then even that is cringe worthy even um, even 50 years ago i mean that was just so wrong and um it, it really was jarring but you know the and next it day so, they're so jack parr i mean you know. and that would make sense that you would have been watching because i guess <clears throat> I wasn't really a comedy guy, but it must have been a pretty com big comedy. It was a big event, deal. He was you know. he was coming back, you know, Jack Parr. I mean, what a. All right, so here's my question. All right. It's not even a Beatles story, but it's true of me, and I wonder when you're in grammar school, at some point, you walked out of school after soccer practice or after you stayed late, and you saw a teacher walking to her car or his car, smoking a cigarette. And it just didn't compute. It was like, it was, did, did that strike you wrong? Uh, no, that makes 100% sense to me. That was the time that we lived in, and it didn't compute. It made no sense. To see a teacher, I mean, I'm not talking about the no, fact that smoking, I, I, I'm no, talking no, about it's exactly, a teacher smoking, No, not because, for any other reason, but that's, a high authority, and that's too regular. It's like almost like seeing them. You never even went in the teacher's lounge because you don't want to see them no, eating a no, bagel, right? No, 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 no. And separate that bathroom? is the same feeling the first time I saw Ringo smoking or Paul McCartney smoking. It was that same, no, no, no. which, which yeah. makes no sense with them being musicians. And, you know, but I just wonder if, the, if any of those same Feelings oh, show. absolutely. The, the, the students put teachers on a pedestal. I mean, I thought it was odd if I ever saw a teacher in sneakers all of a sudden, you know? 
Um, exactly. And you put Ringo and Paul up on the biggest pedestal on the planet. Right. And I can see that just does not compute. Have you got a butt? Does not compute at all. You made me think of a very filthy Jim Myers joke. Do you, you know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> People say, yeah, oh, you got to respect women. You got to respect women. And he's like, oh. respect women. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> he's like, I put women on a pedestal. <laughs> It's easy to get at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not exactly, he, that's because not exactly he would he say because it makes it easier to look up their dress. Yeah, we didn't say that either. <laughs> oh, that's the clean version. Uh, oh, boy. Yes. So, so I have a couple of really great uh, Howard Stern guest stories, but we're going to save them. Um, the one I will tell you is we finally got Milton Berle on the show. I think he had just put out, put out his 5,000th book, and he was thrilled because I think it was the first phone call he'd gotten in 30 years. <laughs> yeah. And he came in and sat there on the show, and then when the show goes to commercial and he leaves, we all got up, and I might have told you this already, and we get up and we're walking down the hall, I'm on my way to the bathroom, but Milton Berle's with the guy who was handling him at the time. and. He turned to the guy and said, he talked about my penis for 45 minutes. <laughs> he didn't say penis, but no. He was just flabbergasted. Was like, there wasn't a word in that interview that didn't have something to do with the size of his wiener, you know. Well, that, he was legendary for that. And a couple of other... Yeah, well, he was, till he came in the bathroom and stood next to me. And then it was like, <laughs> so, goodbye to that myth. <laughs> but a couple of other... Uh, Celebrities are also famous for that. Milton Berle and uh, Forrest Tucker. Forrest Tucker and Victor Mature, according Victor Mature. to my yeah, lovely a, wife. It turns out there's a bunch of them because it, they, it, a lot of it came out in that. Uh, there's a really wild book called. Um, uh, full service. Full Did service. Did you ever hear of it? There was a guy that got women and men for all of Hollywood for 50 years. And it's, if you like gossip, this guy, he finally died, but before he died, he was at like at 93, he did a documentary. Because all the stuff in this book is true, but he waited till everybody was just about dead. And it's stuff about, I'm not talking about sketch characters on the, you know, we're talking about Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn. Yeah. You know, not the obvious Rock Hudson, but the, you know. Scandal or just? Just truth, truth of what, who did what, you know. I love Errol Flynn. And uh, 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 you know. I mean, do you think that he could have had oh, a please. career that would have gone on 10 years longer had he had, had taken care of himself at all? Well, you know, well, the whole self-destructive thing is so built into this whole thing. Listen, well, we're going to take a break because I really, uh, I, I just sort of said something almost really off color, and I realized it, it could end our show, so I'm not going to say what I'm going to do during the break. All right. Act it out. I'm not going to say who I'm going to see or what I'm going to do or, or how, anything about that. But we will be back. All right. Now, you might not recognize me next week, because I'll be wearing a different shirt. <laughs> Hey, a new episode of Stand Up Memories every Wednesday. How exciting is that? It's starring me, Peter Bales, and right here, Jackie the Joke Man Martin. Please follow us on social media. Search it out. What is it? Me Space? My Space? Your Space? TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Do da, do da. <laughs> <laughs>